Hey, what's up everybody? This is Titan from Titans of CNC. And we are live on Facebook and YouTube and all platforms. Actually, not live on all platforms, but we are live on Facebook and it will be on all platforms, all right? So today we're gonna talk business. We're gonna talk about being an entrepreneur. We're gonna talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, the struggles, right? And, and, and the mountains that when you get up to the top and you look, there is no greater feeling than knowing that you own your own business, knowing that you're not working for other people, knowing that you have employees and their families are being taken care of because of the decisions that you've made, the chances that you've taken, the, the ability to, to have the courage to take the chips and put them all on the table, knowing that you're risking everything. Business, I love business, I love it, and, and I've been through so many hard times, and I've been through so many good times, I've, I've met so many amazing people, I've, I've, <laughs> I've sat with homeless people, I've, I've, I've worked with, you know, just complete, you know, guys who are just entering the trade, and I've sat with billionaires, literally, and millionaires and, and talked business in huge boardrooms, right? So we have a lot of experience. And the cool thing about technology and Facebook and just this, this platform right here is that anybody, no matter where you're at, you guys can tune in right here and actually listen to somebody who's been in the game, right? And we're gonna give you that knowledge. We're gonna talk like I was your dad or grandpa or you know, brother or something, somebody that you can respect and actually listen to. And all the things that we're gonna say is not all going to be roses and rainbows, right? Because it's hard work, it takes determination and grit. But if you get the message and you actually understand, you can, you can see and maybe weave through the obstacles a little bit quicker because you got a little bit of experience. You've, you've heard some things, you've taken the good, thrown out the bad and made it happen. All right, one thing I wanna say is, if you are on Facebook for the first time, please follow us because we are going to be going live. We're gonna be bringing crazy videos to you to teach you this trade. I'm gonna be going to huge companies and talking to huge people. I'm gonna be talking about processes and robotics and everything and basically bringing it to you for free live. If you're on YouTube, please subscribe to the YouTube channel because the same thing, we're gonna bring it to you live, we're gonna train you. A lot of people out there are teaching tool paths and stuff. We're gonna teach you how to succeed in this business and be successful, all right? So, all right, let's go. So one thing, I, one thing I'll say is, I'm just gonna talk a little bit, like a little bit, not like last time, I wanna talk a little bit about my journey and then I'm gonna open it up quicker for questions because at the end of the day, I wanna answer your questions live, all right? So let's just start with a picture. I, I had this on the wall and I walked past it today. We weren't planning anything because everything's live. And I actually want to short share a picture with you guys. So check this out. Ah, uh, so, what, so what is this? What is this? You know what this is? Every time I look at this, I think back 12, almost 13 years ago, right at the beginning of 2005, when I put all my chips on the table, when I had talked to everybody and put out a game plan, put a business plan together, when I had gone out for customers, when I had, when I had worked every deal I could and, and went from having no money in my pocket to getting different investments and stuff and actually going out on business for myself, renting a building, right? You know, putting my name on the line when I had bad credit and renting a building, you know, and then telling, you know, Haas Automation that almost, what is that? I think it was like close to $300,000 worth of machines that basically I never owned the house. I never, I rented, right? I didn't have cars when I was young and stuff, right? So now I'm saying I'm going, I'm putting all my chips on the table and I'm going to lease these machines and you gotta trust me, I'm going to do this. And for me, there was no going back. I was gonna do it no matter what. So when I look at this picture, I remember the day of that truck coming up my driveway to my shop with my clean floors, 
right? And we had four machines. We had two VF2 SS's, horses, right? We had two ST10's and one, so you can see the four, I'm like backwards, you can see the four machines here and you can see the bar feeder over here, right? I was very, I had found a niche. And that's one of the things important is I had found a niche. I would worked at many companies. I had solved big problems for big companies where they had massive horizontals and cell systems and, and scrap parts. And I'd come in as a programmer to actually solve part programs, to solve problems and make programs for the right people to gain a respect in the industry. And then I'd ran and actually built shops, right? And you guys have probably heard me before where I've talked about times where I thought that I was being like screwed over by somebody because I had built and helped build a business and then left with nothing, you know, and, and, and basically everything just fell apart. Later on when I owned my own machine shop, I understand that that was exactly what I had to go through because, you know, I knew how to run machines, but I didn't understand how to run electrical. I didn't understand how to put up air. I didn't understand the specs and how everything had to be put together, right? I didn't understand how to, you know, I needed to take my customer service to a top level. I had to take my quality to a top level. I had to really learn about the trade and, and basically be well-rounded, right? Programming isn't good enough when you're actually going to start a company, okay? So I went from shop to shop and basically picked a little bit up, picked a little bit up, picked a little bit up, and finally I went out on my own, went on a journey, put a couch in my shop, brought a TV, and I literally wor worked for 24 hours a day. My wife would come in, watch videos, bring the kids, and basically watch videos, and I would just set up my machines, double vices, parts all across I would fill up the envelope and basically go to have a long run time the parts might only take in two or three minutes but because I ran so many of them I could actually run them for like an hour and walk away so I could run four machines by myself right and I was working with a guy Jeff Weaver who like you know I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him because he was a machinist that actually you know got involved with me and He's my only guy that actually invested in my company. And today he's in Texas, retired with a brand new house and, and a great life. And, and he is uh, one of the dear people in this world that I actually love and look up to. But together we basically built this shop, right? We put the long hours in. You know, I, I, I would sleep for an hour. I'd get up, change parts out, sleep for an hour. I wasn't like, oh my Lord, like I'm, I'm, I'm working 20 hours a day. I was like, yes, I'm working 20 hours a day. We're murdering it. Like we're just making it happen, you know? And every time somebody would come into the shop, I basically would, would show them the setups and I'd have such pride and such passion. And I'd be like, everybody's running at this and we're running at 800 inches a minute. We're doing this, we're doing this. When everybody's still over here, we're up here. So I was creating a niche by saying that, you know, this is 12, 13 years ago. So I, I was running the machines at peak and therefore I was showing my customers that I could solve their problems by giving them a part at a lower price, right? Coming into uh, my first month, I think my first month in business, I did like $33,000. Crazy. And that's more money I'd ever even thought I could make. And then literally every month, it went from 33 to like 44 to like 50 something to 60 something to seven. And I remember like getting my first check, my first check. And like, you know, I had to go, I had ran out of money. I had to go to my customer and say, hey, I'll give you a 5% discount if you'll actually pay me early. I'm starting my company, boom, boom, boom. And they actually paid me early. I remember getting my first check and being like, this is from a company that I built. I put it all on the line and boom, right? We started like hiring people and stuff. And I remember like all of a sudden, I got my first month, I think it was my 10th month in business, I did $100,000. A hundred, like $100,000, you know? And I just remember like just being in awe and it even inspired me more, you know? 
and and it just and it just continued up all the way up to a million dollars in a month you know what i mean and and then the drop and then everything you guys know the story right but it has been the most amazing journey since then we have we have made tv shows we've done the academy we've gone in and build a school in San Quentin prison. My shop is running right now. We're running production work, making it happen, five access. Literally, my guys are right over there, you know, and um, I have an amazing team. You know, I have a bunch of friends right here. You guys are all watching me and stuff. As you guys pop up, I actually recognize a lot of you guys because we're communicating back and forth, all right? So anyway, that's just a little bit about how I started, all right? I don't want to go too much now. I want to actually start answering some questions, if that's all right. So. I have Kristen, she's my office manager, and I asked her to sit right over here, and she is going to actually, I got some other guys over here, I got D, I got Billy, I got Joel, and they're monitoring the cameras and monitoring the social, and they're basically going to be um, picking out the different questions and stuff that we're going to go through. All right, so Kristen, what's the first question? Okay, what is the best way to get connections and leads for work? Are there any machining associations that could help not only to push growth, but also bring in new work? And that is by? That is by Tom S. Tom S. So Tom, the best way to get work. So let, let me like, let me, let, me talk, let me talk to you about something, okay? Machining, it's a way of life. It's, it's a philosophy, right? There's no trick way to actually go and get work. Otherwise, everybody would be doing it and you'd be in a pile, right? Of people trying to say the same thing and do the same thing, right? Like I always say programmers, there's, every programmer is different based on his experiences and how he approaches a job and how he's able to think outside the box to bring something new that would be revolutionary and actually the efficiency would make money for the company, right? So when it comes to getting work, it's the same thing, okay? One thing that it starts when you actually build a company, okay? First thing that you have to understand in building a company is you have to build it on quality. You have to make sure that your quality is unbelievable. Even if you have one machine, you gotta make sure that your quality is perfect. You gotta make sure that your documentation is perfect, right? So, so you're checking your parts and you're documenting like a FA first article in process. An FA is a first article inspection report. Then you have an in process. Then you have a final, right? Having those documents in place that you actually fill out, right? And then actually having a, a quality manual that dictates the entire process of your quality, right? So what I'm saying is, even if you have one machine or manual machines, you start your quality process early. Guess what? The quality process and how you do things and how you make things and the successes is going to give you confidence, right? So when you speak, you're going to exude confidence, right? Another thing is perfect your processes, okay? So it's, so it's not like running out and actually like, it's not running out and actually going in and doing it this way one time and that way one time and that way and just, you know, kind of like what, whatever. You got to understand, okay, this is my machine. How can I run it and keep it running nonstop, right? So I'm going to answer the question, but I'm laying down the groundwork. How do I get this thing to run nonstop? Okay, we're going to standardize tooling. We're going to put a tool list in here, leave some pockets open. We're going to program off those tools. And actually, because I never have to put the tools in and they're all zeroed off the same spot, then all of a sudden I can just make a program, put it in, and I can basically just press go and it's just going to like murder it once I have my XY0, Z0 on my part, right? So I save time. How do we, you know, maybe do pallet systems where, you know, you're taking the fixtures, doing different things, you're popping in a pallet, boom, you know what I mean? And then making your part, if, if that's a repeat part, you take it out, you put something else in, you bring it back, boom. How do we perfect our processes? How do we, now, now that we have the processes perfected, we're doing, we have a standard of how Titan or Tom or whoever does things, and we have, we have, done our checks and balances to make sure that we are absolutely like perfect, that, that 
we have judged the other ways of doing things, we've looked outside the box and we agree that this is the best way to do it, then we move to how we, we actually machine our parts. And, we, and we, we look at our programming style and we look at how we make things and we make sure that we're efficient, right? And, and we make sure that basically all our tool paths, all our drills, all the things that we're doing are incredibly efficient, okay? So now, what does that have to do with the problem? That has to do with the problem because you take that entire package, that's your workmanship, that's your shop, that's what you guys stand for, and you sell it. You sell it. So now that we're in the academy and stuff, a lot of times I wouldn't talk about my customers, but I'll actually talk about a customer, all right? So SpaceX, I've been doing work for SpaceX for a long time. I'm not gonna get too into it, but my, my thing right here is that there's a million, there's a million like football players on the field over here, but nobody's like willing to actually teach this stuff. Nobody's like stepping up to actually teach how to compete. So that's what I'm doing. I'm coming in to try to tell you like how to do it. All right. So, you know, I've been doing work for that company for a long time. How did I get into the company? Six months, six months. I sent letters. I sent letters. I, I wrote, I called up and I actually made friends with the ladies at the desk and I told them my story. I told them the, and I solved the, how I was solving problems and why I was different and how I machined titanium and, and how I had these big horizontal mills and stuff and, and all the different things. I told them a story and then I would call back and I would call back and guess what? All of a sudden, one time one of them said, you know what, here's an email of a buyer that can actually make it happen. And I was like, oh, you know? And then I started like calling that person, calling that person. That person's like, oh, you're calling me, but like maybe you should go to this person. So I went to that person, boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden on my email one day, I just looked and I just got print after print after print after print. This is a long time ago, this is like 2009. And I looked at my wife, my wife walked in and she knew because we were like literally praying over the, the envelopes of, you know, the letters we were sending and stuff. And all of a sudden, boom, I got in. And people would ask me from down there, like nobody up in Northern California, Northern California was doing that work. And they're like, how'd you get in? I'm like relentlessness, like, like perseverance. Like, you know, every week I said on Friday, I'm going to do this. Like I read an article about that guy and he was, he, you know, sold PayPal, Elon, he sold PayPal. He basically was like looking up at the sky and he's like, you know, how are we going to colonate Mars? Like, what's the plan? And he looked up and there's no plan. And he's like, I'm going to build an aerospace company and we're going to colonate Mars. And all of a sudden I'm like, I want to do work for that guy. You know what I mean? And, and, and also it was like such difficult work to help me build the basically help me build everything as far as my reputation and stuff. But that's just one example. Another example is, is selling it to all the tool reps and the tool reps would go out to different companies and they would actually go to companies and companies would be like, hey, do you know any good shops? Do you know this? Do you know that? And then all of a sudden they'd be like, oh man, Titan, he's running like these things. He's like sleeping at the shop. He's got this crazy story. He's like murdering like the parts or like he's just cutting them so fast and this and this. And now he went from like having two guys to now they got 10 guys. And now they got 15 guys. You know what I mean? And, and the story works. Then all of a sudden people are calling on the phone. Here's a secret. I have no sales guys. I never have. It's always been me. You guys see me on here. I am the sales guy because nobody can speak it better than I can. Nobody can have the passion for my company better than I can. Like, and I'm a programmer. If I sit in front of you and you show me a part, I will say, look, you guys are running two parts. I will make a fixture plate. I'll fixture it with 30 parts. We'll do this. I'll walk away from the machine and my regular price will be this and I'll drop that price, right? And we'll make it happen. And, and that conviction, that passion, that story sells it. So the answer to the question is hard work, determination, relentlessness, go after the customers. If there's medical companies, aerospace companies, any companies around, go in, ask for the buyers and, and ask, ask for them, find out the names, this and that, work the deals, make it happen. Look on LinkedIn, you know, look up the company, put buyer, search, you know, just figure it out. It is a game. Some people can get it, some people can't. But if you get in with the big boys, make sure you can do the work because that's how you keep the work and consistency. 
All right. So next question. All right. From TJ Mead. TJ Mead. Oh, what's up? I have a burning passion to own my own shop. It could be a small garage shop so long as it sustains my household. Where do I even begin? All right. So TJ Mead. I'm saying that correctly, right? I know TJ. I've seen him. Seen him on here. So I want to own my own shop. I'm not sure how to start. Okay. So let me let me let me say something. There's a lot of people that want to own their own shops, right? There's a lot of people that say, "Oh, I don't have money. I don't have this. I don't have that." One thing that I one thing that I have learned is that by speaking it into existence, you're putting it out there. And it gives you something tangible to work for, right? So the first thing that I would say is make sure you have the talent and the skills. Don't go after it until you are correctly prepared for that journey. Because if you start out, if you jump into you know the varsity team when you're still haven't even done JV, you might get swallowed up, and you could have been great, right? So make sure that. You hone your skills. Make sure that you work at a shop that actually allows you to actually make different types of parts. Make sure that you learn inspection. Make sure that you learn how to talk to engineers. Make sure you learn how to tell your story, right? And and while you're doing that, I'll use you know, while you're doing that, find a small machine, find a used machine, right? So find a machine and actually get it in your garage and start playing with it. Start doing things. Start doing things. You know, and after a while, when you get to a place where you can be competitive on that machine, then start going to other job shops, going to other places and stuff. If you, if you're not at a level because you don't have your documentation, you don't have your different things where in place so that you can get in with big companies, maybe you actually need to go to other. Machine shops and say, "Hey, what about if I build your tooling? I'm a great programmer. I can build all your jaws for you. I can build fixture plates. I can do these different things. And like, I'll charge you 45 bucks an hour or something. Not saying that's what people should work for, but if it's in your garage and you're trying to make a name, sometimes you got to drop your price to get the work to make it happen, right? And then, like life, it's about maturity. It's about levels, and you just keep stepping up on those levels." To basically get up here to success, right? What is success? Success is something different for every single person. But I think at, when you're an entrepreneur and once you've tasted success, I think it is like、uh, it's kind of addicting. You just want to try new things and new things and take it to bigger levels, and and that's where you can get in trouble too, because there comes a time where you have to kind of humble yourself and kind of like pull back, right? Back in. 2005, I started my business. In 2008, I was making millions and millions of dollars, and I had 20 CNCs, big Toyota machines, big. Yeah, everybody's like, "Oh, Titan only runs this, like big things, right?" $12,000 payments for a machine, and then 08 happened. All the work died. I was so aggressive, and I was so confident, and literally, it just hit me. I'd never seen anything like it, and it just hit me like all the work. Didn't matter how good it was, it was gone. So today I'm a little different because I I used to have thirty something thousand dollars in dollars in machine payments. I had a thirty thousand dollar rent payment. So today all my machines are actually paid off, and I don't actually run out to get all you know what I mean to change things up and get payments and stuff because I'm just happy that if something happened, I'm still good, right? So hopefully、uh, that answered the question. Boom. <laughs> Keeping my guys awake. Okay, from Jacob Hendricks, did you have work orders before you started your shop? And if not, how did you find it? All right, so it kind of goes. In, so it's from Jacob, right? Yes. Last name? Hendricks. Hendricks. Jason Hendricks. Jacob. So Jacob. Jacob Hendricks. All right, I recognize that name too. What's up? So, so it, it's almost the same line of questioning, kind of like same thing where. You know that's how I went out and got work. Okay, one of the things that happened with me personally is, is that I had worked at different shops. I had people big in the industry because I was running Haas machines, right, at other companies, and basically I started running like 
them fast. And I started doing things. I started running hard metals and doing things and stuff. So when like Haas reps and stuff would actually come into my shop and tool guys would come into my shop, they were always like, dude, what is this? Like, what are you running? Like, what's the chipper? What's the service fee? Like, like, man, I never seen somebody push a horse like this before and this and that. And I was like, man, you know, I'll joke around programming talent, baby. Yeah, you know, and, and stuff. But, you know, passion breeds passion, right? Passion breeds passion. And I told that story and I showed I was open and I had such clarity with everybody for such a long period of time that as soon as, as soon as things happened where I knew like I was done working for people, that I was going to do my own shop. I didn't know how, but I just knew that I was destined to have my own shop. And I took that walk. I started telling everybody my vision and they would say, how much money you got? I'm like zero. Right. But I started telling all everybody my vision and I wasn't going after the work that other people had. Right. I didn't want to be any conflicts, but I started telling that vision and literally my phone started ringing. People started calling me and saying, hey, I heard that you're a great programmer. You're starting your own company. We have these parts. You want to take a look at it and stuff? So this is the craziest thing. When I got my four machines, I had 25 customers lined up. I had way more customers than I could ever handle. They were all excited. They loved the passion. So somebody can say, oh, Titan, oh, he's kind of over the top. He's passionate, this and that. But you know what? Customers love me. They love me because I come in with passion and, I'm, and, I, and I, I put the money on the line and I'm like, this is how much I will make that part for. And then they're, they're thinking, wait, that's like 40% discount of what I'm actually paying. So this guy must not know what he's doing. And then from there, I actually drop the price more. They end up loving me because I am passionate. I go after solving the problems. And, and, and all I care about is making my standard rate for my shop and actually being successful. If I can run all my machines at my standard rate and I can run them multiple shifts, I'm going to be extremely good. So I don't need to overcharge, right? And, and that's how I did it. And that's how you keep those long-term contracts. I have, I have people that right now that I work with that have been with me for 10 years. You know what I mean? So it's awesome. Okay. From Michael H. Michael H. Yeah. I want to maximize my machine. So I'm thinking about learning how to program robots. The goal is to run lights out pallet machining. What are your thoughts on automation? Ooh. Automation. What are my thoughts on automation? He wants to run lights out machining. He wants to run automation. He wants to like get into robotics and different things and stuff. My, my thoughts on automation is it is the most awesome thing in the history of the world. Like, ah, uh, like I'm just like a big kid, right? I just, I love automation. I love the way, where the world is going. And it blows my mind when I see so many people online saying, oh, robots are going to ruin this industry and automation, you know, people aren't going to have jobs and all this, this stuff. Right. And in my head, I'm thinking like, wait, you don't understand. Our industry is already wiped out. We have an $800 billion deficit with other countries, right? And, and if we can bring the work back, maybe we don't have, you know, a hundred people per a hundred shops. Maybe we have, you know, 30 highly skilled guys, right? Because they program robots and automation and, and multitask. Maybe we have 30 guys for 50,000 shops. You know what I mean? Because all of a sudden with automation, everybody's who's making things, they're not thinking about China because prices are going up over there. Shipping and everything's going up over there. All of a sudden you're over here. People are producing parts in record numbers, right? Because technology is allowing us to make everything and now they can actually make them right here. Right? The emergence of five axes, now five axes isn't as expensive as it used to be. And when you standardize tooling and you put a part on a five axis machine and you program quickly with the latest CAD cams out there, you basically can just program something, hit the whole thing at once, right? Flip it over, deck it off, and you have a complete part. Even if it was 11 sides, it's done in record time, right? And then automation just allows you to basically keep that running nonstop. We, a little while ago, um, there was a there was a big um, thing in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was basically a forecast meeting for the elites of our industry. And for the first time ever, there was a massive movement 
that they uh, said it was going to happen in 2018. And they said, and this is before the tax breaks and all the different things that have happened. This was like a couple months back. So they said when it comes to horizontal mills, we're going to see an increase of 85%. And that's a huge percent. So sales of horizontal mills is going to go up 85%. What does that mean? That means everybody's thinking automation. That means we're going to put horizontal mills in. We're going to actually do tombstones. We're going to actually fix your parts to tombstones. And we're going to actually program them in a way that all we do is go from program to program to program. And it just loads and it just makes parts, right? And so in a lot of those, that work that's coming back, we can actually produce it here in America. So I love automation. That's my last long question. Uh. Okay, this is a great one from Zach Burns. Do you think it's more efficient to have everyone program their own jobs at a medium-sized job shop or have one to two programmers that control the programming for the whole shop? Woo, Zach Burns. What's up, Zach? Oh, Michigan. See, I, I know these guys. What's up? Hey, um, all right. So it depends. It depends on the type of work that you're doing, okay? So if you have a massive production company and you have a lot of machines that are actually running on automatic and you have people that are like multitasking and running different machines that are all automated, then you would probably have a low, fewer amount of guys that are actually program. And this is, this is kind of a normal thing in the industry, especially when you get into automotive and you get into like big industry, right? But the world is changing and that's what I want People have to understand that the world is changing. So why do I say the world is changing? Well, when I started being, a, when I started in machining in 1996, I was like coming in and it was the craziest thing I ever saw. And I was so fascinated by it and stuff. And we were working off of 2D drawings and stuff like that. I didn't even, I didn't even thought about anything that would be a solid model, right? But in engineering, like I worked with engineers from Siemens and, and they were just, they were this elite status over here of where this guy actually designed a part for BMW. He designed something and he's in my shop and he actually has the design. I'm actually taking this part and making it real, right? And, and stuff, but there was this crazy separation. Well, the world is changing now because Fus uh, Fusion 360, it's free for all education right? CAD drawing, engineering. Our academy actually took advantage of that platform and we actually made it so we have tutorials where we are teaching everyone this trade for free. And why did I pick Fusion? Not only is Fusion like just getting better and getting better and getting better, right? But it's free for everybody so I can hit a massive amount of people, right? And it's just an amazing thing. So all of a sudden, when you look at our academy, I'll get the plug in, academy.titansofcnc.com, free for everyone. So that was good. All right, so when you go to the academy, you can actually look in there and you can basically like pick a tutorial. Like you can go to education, learn to design in CAD. You can go to one of our parts and you literally just click this video, it's a tutorial. A lot of people are teaching bits and pieces. We're teaching you how to make legit parts from start to finish, right? So you actually go from start to finish. All right, we're gonna do a rectangle. Click, click, pull, boom. Right click, extrude, boom, solid model, right? And, and basically it's easier than ever. So our industry is the, the the most elite industry, it's a crazy industry. Like there's billions and billions, trillions of dollars in this industry. It's what built this country. But so many of the, the top people making, making the decisions, they were on machines back in the day. They don't, they tout like advanced technology, but they don't truly get how easy it is now, right? So what I'm saying is now, any kid, like right here on the Academy, in our Facebook group, right? The Titans of CNC Academy Facebook group. We got seven year olds actually designing parts and engineering parts. We got 13 year olds, we got kids. I go to the, I go to the, the college and I see the kids from Dan Frank's school, Rockland High School, boom, shout out. 
But I, I go to the school and these kids are 15 years old and they're CNC machining, they're designing, they're making their own parts, they're making motorcycle parts, they're making all kinds of stuff and they're 15 years old. So that separation is no longer there. You know what I mean? So I believe that the, the machinists of the future, th that people who are going to rise and be good are well-rounded machinists that actually understand the fundamentals of putting a vice on, indicating stony, you know, tool geometry, everything. They understand all the, the different things and stuff. And they also understand CAD and how to actually do five axes. People are like, well, you don't need to learn five axis because not all shops have five axis. Five axis is easy. It's easy. It's a three axis and it has dynamic offsetting. And you basically program it like a three axis and it spits out the code. The code does it for you. Like you got to understand how easy it is. So why hold people back? If you, if some, you can take a kid and put them right here and in the same amount of time you could put them here. I want my kid to be here. If he co comes back, Maybe, you know what I mean, he, he can do this, or maybe he'll go to a different company that's actually making aerospace parts because that industry is blowing up, and he'll actually do this and actually get paid twice as much, you know what I mean? So I believe that the future is engineering, it's machining, problem solving, multitasking, passionate guys who can do all of it, and they can go from machine to machine to machine and just make it happen, all right? Okay, here's one from Heather Sawyer. Heather Sawyer. Oh. Finishing. Do you believe it's better to take full control and expand your shop to do finishes in-house like anodizing, chromate, or continue to use outside companies who specialize in those processes? All right. So, so we're talking about the question is on finishing. It's on not surface finishing as in like metal, but actually outside processing as in anodized and different types of coatings and stuff. And should you bring it in house or out, right? Here, here is the, here's the, the thing. It depends on the company. It depends on your experience level, depends on the money that you have and your goals, right? So when I started my company, I was a, solid machinist, right? I was a solid programmer. Like I had a vision. I, I understood that I had talked to engineers and stuff, but when it came to like payroll and it came to QuickBooks and it came, I hired somebody to actually come in and do the job, but I actually hired an outside person to actually take care of my payroll because I wanted it to be done by an expert right there. And I didn't even want to like, like think about it. Right. When it came to different things, I actually hired people outside, I, whether it be accounting, which was a different company, different things. I actually hired experts to take care of it so I could focus on what I would, could do best, right? And when it comes to my shop, if, I make, if I'm making $100,000 or I'm making whatever, I looked at anodizing and it didn't make sense to me, right? Because of the amount of money that I was um, bringing in. When you take a tank, you got to understand like, Okay, to build a tank, that is a, or bring in a tank, a system, that's a certain amount of money. To put all the documentation and, and qualify and deal with OSHA and deal with all the things and regulations that you have to do, that, that, there's a lot of expense and personnel involved in that. So if you're a regular job shop and you're just making parts and they're always different, it might be better to let the experts do it and deal with the regulations and make it happen, right? But I have other companies who brought products to market that had grand visions. And in manufacturing, there is no better thing when you wanna compete on a global scale than bringing everything in house, right? So these guys actually went out and invested in anodizing, in passivation, in doing different things. When I was doing a lot of passivation, I don't do as much because now I do a lot of different parts that a lot of them don't do, don't need passivation, right? We're doing magnet plate and different things, right? So back in the day, I was like, you know, I had passivation in house and it made sense because I didn't have, I could like deliver parts quicker, but I stopped doing passivation because the need dropped and if like, I don't need to do it, then I don't even want it in my shop because we're dealing with chemicals and ocean, all that kinds of stuff. All right, so it just depends on who you are. If you're a massive company 
It's great to bring it in house, but you got to get the experts that actually know it. And then you can put everything and you control your own destiny of when you ship parts. You're not subject to other, other people's customers, right? Okay. This one's from John Schaefer. I John Schaefer, number one Academy group. What's up, John? Boom. I would like to put my son on the payroll for the jobs he runs, but currently we are just running jobs and paying bills. Will this put us in any crazy tax or insurance costs? Ooh, that's a, that's a touchy, that's a touchy feely question right there. So basically John Schaefer, you know, the Academy, small groups. He's my very first guy. So I actually know him well. Unbelievable guy, unbelievable guy for guys who don't know John, He's the Academy Group number one, the first Academy Group. He has a CNC shop that he actually opened to the public. That's how we're solving the skills gap. That's how we're lifting up everything is shops are opening up their doors to actually allow people to come in and they're teaching them the trade going through the Academy projects and stuff. So John has an amazing shop. He basically works during the day at another shop to take care of his family. He invested in a machine, he invested in a space. He has got the American flag up there. He's got this beautiful little shop right there, but he just doesn't have the amount of work that it takes to actually sustain probably, you know, high level payroll and high level everything. Because once you jump into that world, there's a lot of money involved. You know what I mean? Now you're dealing with big things. You're dealing with all the taxes. You're de dealing with workers comp. You're dealing with all of it, right? So my question, my answer to that is basically, I believe that everything should be come through the, the company. I don't think you should be paying it out of your personal. I think that you should talk to your accountant and you should figure out a game plan. And if you're paying your son to actually come in, Either he needs to be an employee or a contract worker, which could save you a little bit on the, in the beginning. But basically, maybe if it's coming out of your personal bank account, maybe you actually give a loan to the company to actually take care of that. And then later on the company, because it's a loan, can pay that back to you. So you get back that money tax-free but at, because you put it in. But at the same time, at the end of the year, you can actually have your son and that money in the company so you get the write-off, right? So I think that um, one thing in this business, from the parts that you do, the precision that you do, how you make things, the quality, the, qu the way you run your company, the way you run your books, the way you make these decisions, everything has to be pinpoint accurate. There has to be a process in place. You have to understand the process. And even if it's a little bit more expensive, you have to do it the right way because if you don't, it can come back to bite you. So that, that's what I would say is um, maybe give the company a loan. It could be in small amounts, talk to your accountant, and, uh, but I think it should come through the company. Okay. From Chris Defoe. Chris Defoe. Yes. Chris Defoe. What's up, Chris? What recommendations do you have for a small shop just starting out to choose which vendors to buy tooling and material from? Ooh, all right, so Chris, Christopho, right? So he's asking me, as a small shop starting out, how do you determine who to buy tools from, right? So this is, a, this is actually like a good one, okay? Because business is deals, right? It's deals. Business is selling. It's selling the story. It's selling the deals. When I started out in this business and I had a certain investment to start, I spent the money like that. But because I had to get a building, I had to get, you know, I had to run electrical. I had to get the machines and put a bigger down payment because I didn't have, you know, I didn't have the good credit and stuff. I had to get end mills and vices and, and toilet papers. I had to get everything because I was starting a company, right? So, how I, who and how I got my, my tooling from mattered. So what I did was I actually went to larger companies that actually had all the tooling that I could get. So instead of going to one that specialized in just end mills or going to one that specialized just in drills or this one in boring or this one in vices or this or that, I went to 
somebody who was one of the biggest in the game. And then I sold that story. I told them about all the things that I had done to actually create this company, right? And all the things that we were doing to be successful, all the customers that we had. I sold him the sales rep on like where we were at and where we were going to go. And then I asked for credit. So what people don't understand is that all these companies, they can give you added discounts and they can give you added credit. And it's not always by, it's not always credit. Like in this industry, it's not like the credit when you buy a car. In this industry, they look at real things. Do you own a house? Do you this and that? Like, you know, how long have you been in business and how much money do you make? So at the beginning, you got to tell them the story to make up for the deficit of history right? And you got to sell it to them. So I basically had a company right from the beginning, give me $40,000 in credit so I could actually go buy a bunch of double vices because I knew that I, I, I sprung for double vices in the beginning because I knew I had the type of work that would allow me to do it. And if I could only run a couple parts, it was not going to work because I could not run four machines by myself, right? So bigger companies that have that have multiple parts that you need. If you have a small company that basically still has everything, that's fine. But basically go in and they're more likely to make a deal with you because they, they can. They have a little bit of stability right there and they want to help you so that you become a lifelong customer. When you run your CNC equipment hard and it's to the limits, how often do you check geometry and have your equipment calibrated? That's from Ben Helbich. So, um, all right. So how, how, how long, how long do I have my, uh, how often do I have my calibrations, right? Yes. Okay. So calibrations. So it's on tooling and inspection. It is on checking your geometry when you're running your CNC equipment hard. Okay. So the, the, so you got to have a plan in place to actually check out your machines, have maintenance, right? So, so, you know, you don't take a whole day off. You do it bits and pieces. You have a plan. You have a process that you actually go through to actually make sure that your, the lubricants, the seals, everything's good in your machine. So that's one thing, right? You, you have to hear your machines, you gotta understand your machines, but how I actually understand my machines, besides just touching it and having that feel, how I actually like test out my machines is through quality control. So we have a CMM and when you take a part on that and we're checking, we're using, using a profilometer, we're actually checking that surface finish and making sure that that surface finish is exactly where it's supposed to be per that end mill, per that program, and we have a history on it. So all of a sudden, if I'm not getting, if my, my, my end mill's brand new and I'm not getting the surface footage, then I'm gonna make some changes and stuff and I still can't get it, then all of a sudden I know that there might be a problem and I actually go and actually call for service to like double check my ball screws or, or whatever, right? But um, CMMing in quality, double checking, accuracy especially when you get into the tents and stuff of keeping everything perfect is how you know flags come up and tell me that basically something is off right and then inspection equipment one thing people have to understand about inspection equipment is that has to be calibrated your cmm has to be calibrated everything has to be done if you're doing work for aerospace and big companies you have to understand that a shop could be in a different state. How do they know that your parts are good? How do they have faith? Because they look at a document that says an outside agency actually inspects all your inspection equipment, right? Every six months, right? And that you have a plan in place to determine exactly how to make it all happen, right? So they understand they're not going to take your word that you checked your inspection equipment, that your mics and your debt mics and everything is perfect right they're going to take somebody else's they want to see that tag when they come in to check your place they want to see the tag so you have to have a good relationship with an outside firm that will actually come and inspect 
your inspection equipment. So we're almost, so I could go on forever, but we're going to do like a series. We're going to answer more questions and stuff. So I'm going to, I'm going to answer one more question and then we're going to be done for today. And I'm excited. Earlier when I had a hiccup, they were telling me about the time and stuff. And I just was like, so my mouth can go, but I was like distracted. All right. So we got one more question. We're good. All right. Boom. Okay. From Michael Spearman. When starting out, would you recommend leasing or financing a new machine or starting with a quality older machine you can purchase outright? Ooh. So when I started my, so I jumped in, right? Four brand new machines. I jumped in. What was, what was my niche? What was my niche? My niche was running the machines Boom. My niche was, was running hard and fast, making it happen. At the beginning, I had a lot of aluminum parts and I fixed a lot of parts and I had to run them fast. And I knew that the SS's ran at 800 inches a minute. I know that during the corners, it would slow down and different things, but it was a selling thing I could do. So because I wanted to be successful, I actually sold to my customers. I'm like, I got the most advanced. So this is 2005. So the SS's were like it, right? So for like the Haas Mills and stuff. So I, I sold it to my customers. We have the SS's, they're 800 inches a minute. Everybody's running at 100, 200 inches a minute. I'm gonna rough, rough everything at 800 inches a minute. Then I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna take the pressure off, I'm gonna kiss it, I'm gonna make you perfect parts. And they're gonna be at a discounted price and then boom. So, But I knew I had to have the best machines. So I put all my chips on the table. I went after great machines that I could afford to actually sell it to the customers, right? But check this out. So Matt Wilkinson, Matt is actually in the academy and Matt asked me something, everybody just watched. So, so Matt is in Oregon and he's a welder, right? And he makes these awesome bumpers for big old trucks like mine, right? With the big hooks and everything. Like he makes these bumpers and stuff. And he had a water jet, he had welders, he had all these different things, right? I think Rampage Machining or Rampage, that's the company. But he basically came on, he's like, Titan, what should I buy? And I said, you know what? You actually can pay like a 10% down on a Haas machine and actually get a Haas machine and you can do this and this and, and stuff. And he's like, well, I want to get it paid off. So he actually went, bought a, a sand, he took his sand rail, sold it, took the money, went and bought a machine, I think like in Canada or something. Everybody in our Facebook group basically watched him. We watched him like say, oh, this is the machine I'm gonna go. Then he, the machine showed up and then he put it on the floor and then he went through the academy for one month and basically, he basically learned how to CNC a machine in one month making all the academy building, bar, um, building block parts and then basically got his first order for like 2,400 parts. Now he has his own parts and he made it happen and guess what? He has no machine payment. Prove me wrong. You know what I mean? He just proved me wrong. So what was great for him was not great for me. And it depends on the circumstances. It depends on the industry. It depends on who you're working with, but you just have to have an open mind. You got to think outside the box and do what's best for you. So there's opportunities to get one with a zero price at the end of the day. You don't have to make any payments and another one where you make a payment, but maybe the efficiency and stuff is on a higher level. So anyway, Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We are almost done. We're about to uh, hit that button right there. Remember, if you guys are on YouTube, make sure that you hit that button to subscribe. I will see you guys in the Facebook group. Ah, uh -uh. boom.